Hello everyone, we're getting ready to look up today with a brand new Uplook video, tackling one of our top 10 lists. You can like the video, subscribe, and ring the bell to make sure you don't miss out on any of our future videos. Today's topic is 10 life lessons I learned by hanging around godly people. Booker T. Washington said, quote, it's better to be alone than in bad company, end quote. But it's best to find yourself in the company of people who live just to please God. It's exhilarating. It's transforming. It's worth everything you think you have to sacrifice to do it. Here are 10 simple truths I learned in my almost 70 years in the best of company. God saints. So as we turn to your life lessons, things you've learned through really other people's lives, mm -hmm. we see number one, life is short. Redeem the time. That is so sure. I mean, I used to read verses like, our life is like the grass, our life is like uh, the wind, it's like a tale that's told. It didn't really connect with me, but to look back now and say I've lived almost 70 years, I can't imagine what that number even means. And yet it's true that time is moving us inexorably along and we need to buy up the opportunities while we have them. It was Henry David Thoreau who said, you can't kill time without injuring eternity. And uh, we realize that God is giving us this non-renewable resource in order to invest it in eternity. And if we don't, it just falls to the ground. And so we need to buy up those opportunities. And I had the privilege of spending time with people like the Harlows and the Pells, my own family, my parents, grandparents. And these were people who took life very seriously. Not that they were panicked, not that they were uptight. They enjoyed life as they went through it, but they looked for every opportunity to invest in the world to come. Your second life lesson, is to distinguish between the urgent and the important. Yes, there's a famous little book by Charles Hummel called The Tyranny of the Urgent. And the idea is that most things in life that are urgent are not that important. I've got to get the poodle clipped. I've got to pick up the laundry. Most things in life that are important don't necessarily seem very urgent. I should witness to my neighbor, I should study this passage of scripture, I can always do that tomorrow. And so the devil's tactic is to make sure that our list every day is crammed with so many urgent things that we never have time for the important. And uh, I'm not saying don't get little Fifi clipped, I'm just saying that make sure on every day's schedule the important things don't lose out. Number three. Treat your tongue like the dangerous serpent that it is. The scripture says that if you're perfect in this area of the tongue, then you're a perfect man. Obviously, I'm not. I've had to learn the hard way that my tongue can do a lot of damage as well as a lot of good. And so we need to uh, be careful in what we say. I remember Harold McKay, he had a great line. He said, when in a crowd, watch your tongue. When with your family, watch your temper. When you're alone, watch your thoughts. That's really good advice. And it recognizes the devil attacks us in different ways. And because I spent a lot of my time in public, especially on a public platform, he was always looking for ways to get me to use my tongue to do things that were contradictory or negative or damaging. And so it's really crucial that we pray the ancient prayer of the psalmist, Lord, set a watch at my tongue. But I think it's a greater secret. Let the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O oh God. If we are concerned about the meditations of our heart, we won't have to be so concerned about the words of our mouth because out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. And if I'm careful about my thoughts and my motives and my emotions, then they will be determined before they actually get to my tongue. Number four, wherever you are, be all there. 
Yeah, the idea is bloom where you're planted. There are a lot of people, especially in this present generation, who are afraid to land. They're afraid to be all there. If you ask them, where do you live, they won't actually tell you where their home is. They'll say, well, at the present time, I'm in so-and-so. And this is a mark, actually, of affluence. Maybe you've taken a little tour somewhere in a wealthy area of the country, maybe down in Florida, and you see all these lavish homes along the river, along the sea coast, and these are their places. It's not their home. They have a place in Palm Springs and a place in London and a place in New York, but no place to call home. And the danger is that as our options increase, we're afraid of missing anything. And in anticipating looking everywhere else, we actually miss living life right where it is before us. When we were first married, we had a little cottage and I grew up in a Scottish home. And so I had bought an area rug for our bedroom, but the, the heat registers were in the floor. And in order to lay the rug down properly, I would have had to cut holes in that rug. And I thought, mm, I don't think I want to do that because we may be moving someday and then I'll want to take this with me and I don't want the hole cut in the rug. And so for four years we lived with the rug rolled back. Ridiculous. Finally one day I thought, this is crazy. I went and got my knife and I cut it and put it down. You know, when we moved, the house we had had wall-to-wall -wall carpet anyway. We didn't need the rug. <laughs> But I just thought it was such a little parable of that feeling like I'm not all here. I'm living somewhere else. We have to live in the present. And so it's a dangerous thing to always be hoping for something better somewhere else. And in the process, we miss out living where we actually are with the wonderful people and opportunities around us. And that really moves into our fifth point, live in the present but not for the present. Exactly. No one's ever crushed by the burden of the day. It's when we add yesterday's regrets and tomorrow's worries to today. That's what ruins us. And so Paul says, forget the things behind and live now. Now, he had two days on his calendar, this day and that day the day when I'll stand before the Lord. And he said, I want to live every this day in the light of that day, so when I get to that day and look back at this day, I'll have nothing to be ashamed of. So that's a very simple way to live. As I say, we don't live for the day. We don't live for the present. We live for eternity, but we live it one day at a time. And to try and live in the day and make the day full, that it has a purpose and it's objective is to please and honor the Lord. So when I go to bed at night, I, I go to sleep under the smile of God. Another day lived for his pleasure. If that's the case, then at the end of my days, as I step into eternity, I'll be a happy man. Number six, don't forget in the dark what you learned in the light. My father went through a very deep and difficult time. We were heading as missionaries to Central Africa, and then the War of Independence broke out in the Congo, the Simba Rebellion, and we couldn't go. And my father had believed that every stage God was leading, and then suddenly the door slammed in his face, and the devil took this as an opportunity to say to him, Nicholson, you imagined the whole thing. This bit about the will of God, you imagined the whole thing. Maybe you imagined your conversion too. Maybe it's all just in your head. And my father went into a time of deep spiritual depression. But what saved him in the darkest of that time was a little verse in the 139th Psalm, verse 12, that says, the darkness and the light are the same to you. And we remember the words in John chapter 1, verse 5, that the light came into this world and the darkness could not overtake it, could not suppress it, because the light of God always drives out the darkness. A little match will drive out a room full of darkness. And when we lay hold of this idea that God is light and in him is no darkness at all, if he's with us in the dark, then our darkness can be turned to light, because the darkness and the light are the same to God. 
When we are in good times, we can say glibly that God has blessed me. As the song says, it's easy to sing on the mountain, but he's also the God of the valleys. And to lay hold of this fact and not forget what we've learned in the good times, that he's the same God in the good times and the tough times, and we can trust him all the way through the strip. And number seven, the joy of forgiveness. I'll never forget speaking on forgiveness in California at a conference and afterwards a young woman coming to me and telling me how God had worked in her life. She had been abused by her father for so many years and finally fled the home. And uh, some Christians took her in and she learned about the love of God and the will of God for her life. And as she prayed that first night, after discovering this, she asked the Lord to tell her what he wanted her to do. He said, I want you to forgive your father. And she got up the next day and she went to see her father. And she told him, I'm a follower of Jesus now. And he wants me to forgive you, so I forgive you. She said, he never said a word to me. But some years later, her stepmother said to her, from the day you forgave your father, he never laid his hand on me again. And she said to me, you don't realize what chains you release when you forgive someone. When we hold a grudge against another person, we fashion the chain that holds us to that experience, to that circumstance. And when we forgive, we break the chain and we ourselves are set free. Now we're obligated to forgive. We're to forgive as our Father in heaven forgave. How did he forgive us? When we deserved it? When we came crawling on our hands and knees? No. He forgave us before we even repented. Now, we don't get in on the good of forgiveness until we repent. But the forgiveness in our heart is something that can be done. God, before there was ever a sinner that sinned, God calculated the cost and Jesus said, I'm willing to die for that. And so when we recognize this principle that forgiveness is saying, I believe that the cross is enough to forgive all these sins. There's enough in the cross to cover the debt. And on the basis of that, I forgive the person. The moment I'm conscious of it, I forgive them. If they want to enjoy that, there needs to be that restoration. But that's where it starts. And there's nothing like forgiveness to keep the soul clean and the heart happy. My grandfather Robertson practiced this all through his life. And when he died at 96, an old man, it wasn't a wrinkle on his brow. And he couldn't think of anything. When I asked him at 95, was there anything in his life that he wished he could straighten out? He could think of one event back in the Depression years where he bought some chickens that he thought maybe were stolen because they were so cheap and he wished he could fix that. But everything else in his life, he had sought to set straight. And if he had a problem with you, he'd sit down and say, look, we've got a problem, let's fix this. Life is too short to have these complications and to be living in the past, the failures of my own or failures of others. It's a terrible way to live and forgiveness is the key that sets us free. Each of these sound like their own life changing <laughs> um, the list of 10 and with that we move into eight godliness with contentment is great gain this happiness is not in having many things it's in having few wants and this world is constantly reaching out to us advertising trying to get us to be discontented and to want more and it's like the horse leech the proverb speaks about that is never satisfied. And so the human heart is like that. The eye is not filled with seeing, the ear is not filled with hearing. If I'm looking for external things to satisfy me, I'll never be satisfied. I have to have something within me that satisfies. And that, of course, is having Christ. Christ satisfies. And so the statement that you've just made, godliness with contentment is great gain, is put over against, in contrast, that gain is not godliness. Now that's an amazing statement for a Jew to make, because in the Old Testament the idea was that a man could measure his 
spiritual success by his material success. But even in the case of Abraham, it wasn't true that all the wealth he brought out of Egypt was the will of God for him. This was a trap of the enemy. That's where he got Hagar. That's where Lot lost his heart in Egypt. And, and that's where all the dissension came in the family. So material things are not always a blessing from God. And so when we look into the Word of God and see the treasures that we have, we're as rich as we can be. He has blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. And so I can afford to be generous. I can give it away, give away my time, forgiveness as we've been talking about, love, grace, mercy, peace. I can give it away and I'll never have any less. But to look for external things to satisfy my heart, it's a fool's errand. It'll never happen. And so to learn the sweet blessing of godliness with contentment as being the secret of satisfaction, not material things. And then we move into number nine, which is act. Fight laziness with a passion. I don't know if everybody tends to be lazy, but I tend to be. And I think one of the things that motivated me in my early days was learning this principle from my dad that you're not done when you're tired, you're done when you're finished. And to be people who accomplish tasks, who set out to do what you believe is the will of God, and when things get tough, you don't ask God for a lighter load, you ask him for a stronger back and you keep moving on. As your days, so will your strength be. That's God's promise. And so whatever the day measures up, we know God will give us enough strength to get us that way. He has promised not to give us a greater load than we can handle. So God does not bless laziness. It's interesting to notice that we're not worn out by the things that we do we're worn out by the things we have to do that we put off, the things we procrastinate. That's what wears me out. And so it's good at the beginning of the day to set about to accomplish the hardest things first when I have the most energy and then reward myself with the simpler and easier things further down the road. Instead of putting those things off, it's like a snowplow that keeps pushing up a bigger and bigger pile and makes it more difficult for me to accomplish it. So we need doers in the work of God. The Lord Jesus said, if you know these things, happy are ye if you do them. So God help us to act, to fight laziness like a plague, and to give ourselves to accomplishing what God has given us to do. He's promised to give us the strength. He's promised to give us the resources. Let's get on with what God has given us to do. And finally, number 10. Faith works by love. I noticed that at Ground Zero, the World Trade Center, people came back and they stuck little notes around. And many of the notes said very similar things. Tell the people that you love that you love them. Don't just assume that they know that. By the way, son, I love you. Because time runs out, and if only I'd given them that kiss, if only I'd given them that greeting on the way out the door, but I'll never be able to get that back. As they say, no one will ever regret not spending enough time at work. But we do regret not spending enough time loving the people around us. And this is crucial. And, you know, it's not only our own physical families, but our spiritual family. Let's invest in them faith working by love. I remember the story of Harry Ironside. He was traveling by train out to California. And on the way from Chicago, he was having an impromptu Bible study with a number of people from various religious backgrounds. And as they came to the place where the train was going to split so that one part went to San Francisco and one went down to L.A., a lady came to him and she said, I, I never found out what denomination you're, you're with. And he said, well, I'm in the same denomination as King David. She said, King David, what denomination was that? 
And he quoted to her these words from the 119th Psalm, verse 63, I am a companion of all who fear you and of those who keep your precepts. God help us to realize that our greatest wealth is in people. It's in Christ himself and in Christ's people and in the people God has given us to love. And the more we love, the more we're loved. You only get love by giving it away. It's a sad thing that the majority of people are traveling the world looking for someone to love them and tripping over millions of people that need to be loved. If we would love those people, love would come back to us like a boomerang. And so these are tremendous lessons. I tell you, I should have learned more in my little life. I had more opportunity than most. I had encouraging people all around me. But that's something to do. Look out for godly people and stick with them and learn from them. Watch how they live. And God will give us the privilege of growing up in truth, growing up in grace, and manifesting by our lives the beauty of Jesus for all around to see.